this is one thing that could be a serious hiccup for people is that some of those artifacts, those old artifacts that are around, and um, you know these uh, these pores, um, these um, these um, various bones or remains, you know, that are found with these artifacts, they can produce, uh, you know, significant um, um, like uh, paradigm shifting in our society if they're shown to be not from an um you know let's just say our neighborhood um now you know the one of the issue is that some of the stuff that's coming in for instance uh i mean there was a very interesting mummy that was found in in peru in the nazca region of peru and so on and that even when you do a genome analysis and you um, you look at them relative to the human genome, you might actually find that it's very much very similar to the human genome, and you could wrongly assume that uh, then it must be from around here, it must be human, but then you're making a very even larger assumption. And that is that the human genes were not engineered by an advanced race of uh, beings. So, you know, it might not be an accurate um, comparison. Um, and uh, at the Life Expo and uh, Conscious Life Expo and, uh, and in Sedona, I presented, for instance, I think um, William, uh, presented in in Sedon, in uh, in Conscious Life Expo, that uh, that paper from 1973, I believe, from Crick, um, which was the scientist that received the Nobel Prize for describing the DNA structure as a double helix, is one of the best geneticists on the planet. And you know, if you just read his abstract like even just in the abstract of that paper uh what he says is remarkable he says that this most likely the human genome was engineered by uh, and and brought to the earth by by an advanced race of uh extraterrestrials i mean this is uh this is really not a trivial thing to say um, when you're the top geneticist on the planet. Of course, it was ignored by the by the status quo, but uh, this is actually uh, what the most you know uh, revered uh, scientific uh, uh, community had to say about um you know the analysis of the human genome and dna and so on and the probability of that just coming out out of evolution the way it did uh it's it's clearly not you know uh that and that life would have emerged from our planet from a transpermia uh theory that is that somehow a spore or some kind of microbe survived, survived the, the depth of, of space and, and landed on our planet on a meteorite or something and started life. Well, you know, his opinion was most likely not. And uh, the probabilities are very, very sl uh, uh, slim for that, but that, that it actually came from, uh, from, uh artificial you know be basically uh insemination you know of the planet earth you know at artificial insemination of the planet earth uh with the life that's on it um i can see in the comments people are asking which paper that is uh, directed panspermia directed panspermia oh yeah 1973 uh francis crick and lee orgel 
It now seems unlikely that extraterrestrial living organisms could have reached the Earth either as spores driven by the radiation pressure from another star or as living organisms embedded in a meteorite. As an alternative to these 19th century mechanisms, we have considered directed panspermia, the theory that organisms were deliberately transmitted to the Earth by intelligent beings on another planet. You know, remarkable. I could never get away with this, trying to publish something like that. But I guess when you got a Nobel Prize, you know. We conclude that it is possible that life reached the Earth in this way, but that the scientific evidence is inadequate at the present time to say anything about the probability. We draw attention to the kinds of evidence that might throw additional light on the topic. Yeah, well, you know, that's the, that's the thing, the probabilities at the time in 1973, because we didn't know how many other planets there was out there. Actually, the mainstream thought there was very little other planets out there. That's completely reversed. They didn't think as well there was much water out there that's required for life, at least life the way we know it. Uh, and now that's completely reversed as well. We know there's a lot of planets out there. There's at least... For, uh, 40 billion planets in our solar system, in our galaxy, that are in the correct region. That's not all of them. That's just the ones that are in the region that would be similar to the temperatures you could find on Earth so that life could emerge. And that's, again, only considering life as we know it. We don't know. Maybe life can emerge at all kinds of other temperatures and in all kinds of different environments. But but being extremely conservative, um, you know, I, uh, you know, you you get serious amount of like. I think I, I have a slide on this as well. So you, you know, this is um, this is like a, a a very conservative estimate because the um, you know the forty billion. Earth-sized planet orbiting uh, in the um, inhabitable zone. Uh, well, you know, in our galaxy. Well, since that measurement, since that estimate was done, all of a sudden the size of the galaxy has almost doubled. Right, William? We were talking about at least two hundred uh, billion stars instead of a hundred. So that, that 40 billion could be double by now. Uh, that estimate is very, very conservative. Um, and, uh, and then in 2012, we thought there was only 200 billion galaxies. But now uh, in 2016, we found out all of a sudden that there is probably 2 trillion galaxies. So that kind of changed things around again. But, you know, even in this conservative calculation, you still have 80 billion trillion planets that could host life in our universe alone. And some of them could have millions and millions of, of years in, uh, in advancements uh, in, you know, uh, in front of us. So, um, so the probability that there's life out there is, is really high. And the probability, uh, I mean, the universe must be teeming with life. Right? And the probability that, um, that, you know, there is some of these civilization, maybe millions, maybe billions of them, have space travel capability, you know, space time warping capability, is probably extremely high too. And our little earth is quite noisy, meaning, you know, even in modern time, we've been emitting quite a bit of radio wave, quite a bit of noise, you know, with their technology, with their capacity, they would have found us pretty quickly, um, you know, and, uh, and there's no reason they wouldn't have found us at the very Start and the solution of our of our planet, and then on our planet just happens that we find 
over 300 or 400 different cultures around the world, you know, depending on how you're counting, that all talk about, you know, their creation myth involving, you know, star beings, uh, sun gods that came from the stars. Even the Bible talks about, and the sons of God came to the earth. You know, if they came to the earth, they weren't from the earth. And it's <laughs> not son of God, like singular, it's sons of God, plural, um, and, um, and so on. So, um, talks about giants being on the earth and so on. And so, uh, I think it's, uh, when you get somebody of the stature of Francis Creek, um, you know, talking like this, after a lifetime of studying the, the genes and the structure of uh, biology and the human genome and so on, and he says, well, we're probably GMO.